We've lost Pete. Where's Pete? <laughs> so my next Come back. Bit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 28 of the iFreak Show. This week on our panel, we have Andrew Madsen. Hi, from Salt Lake City. James Zuber. I've got a feeling that today's going to be the best show ever, guys. I'm ready. Pete Hodgson. <laughs> no pressure. Ben Sherman. BRB Coalescing Timers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about some of the new APIs out there in uh, macOS and iOS. How much have you guys had a chance to really play with some of the new stuff in some of the new operating systems? We got access to it in June, and some things changed a little bit. And in June, there was almost no documentation. You basically had to go off of what the uh, the header said or what you saw in the WWDC presentations. Uh, so a lot of that stuff, I just, you know, I, I got the ideas from the videos, and I just kept watching the videos, but I didn't really dig in deep until maybe August or something when it was uh, drawing a little bit closer. But since then, yeah, I've just been uh, running through a lot of the networking stuff and a lot of the multitasking stuff. Presumably the networking stuff's important for you in your day job, huh? Yeah, pretty much every app that we do has to deal with networking in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Considering that uh, NSU All Connection, which is like the central class in iOS 6 to do networking, it's what AF Networking is based on, is now deprecated. You know, this is a class that was first designed in uh, around the year 2000. It was made public in 2003, so... This class is more than 10 years old, so it's you know sort of makes sense that it's not really suitable for today's applications. Uh, one of the problems with NSU All Connection is if you were to bring in like a third-party framework that had its own like cookie storage policy or its own custom protocol or something, that configuration is global to the application. Uh, so if you wanted to disable cache, for instance, for a third-party framework, it would like interfere with the application settings. Uh, so now we have NSU All Session which is based on NSU role configuration, and it's an isolated container. So you can have multiple configurations, multiple sessions. Uh, typically, you'd have one session per per API, per endpoint, probably. So like my own endpoint, I'd probably have a way to manage a session uh, for that. And it would have things like the session configuration you can set, like default headers that can go along with uh, every request. So if you wanted to pass along, I don't know, like the, the hardware version of the device that the request is coming from as a header, you could do that there. So does that mean it has each one has its own kind of cookie jar and things like that? Yep, exactly. That's nice. And um, uh, easy methods you can use on NSURL session configuration to create a sensible configuration. The default gives you uh, pretty much what you have today with NSURL connection. Like cache is enabled. It's got some pretty conservative cache uh, settings for memory capacity and disk capacity. But you could further customize it. So if you say NSURL session default or NSURL session configuration default configuration you can further customize it because it returns to you a copy. And uh, there's also another built-in one called ephemeral configuration, which is the equivalent of private browsing. Uh, so with those two, pretty much handy for most cases, and if you need to customize it further, you can. So does um, this mean that for someone making a new application, starting a Greenfield application today, they might consider just using the API that Apple gives you rather than looking at AF networking or something like that? Yeah, so I, I've taken, not necessarily a new stance, but this is an opportunity to sort of reevaluate what's important to you. It's not just cargo culting a library, right? I have like tremendous respect for AF networking and it made a lot of networking code clean and simple in iOS 6. You know, I went, uh, I went about this path of like building a few applications just uh, for myself, just with iOS 7's networking stack. Uh, and to then see, you know, AF networking 2.0 supports this new design. It uses these new classes. But, you know, in order to know, is this worth it or not? Is what is it actually providing? Uh, I think that's a, a valid question to raise. And so one of the things that I get annoyed with is, uh, so in NSURL session, you, uh, there are NSURL session tasks, which represent the requests. So you have like a data task, which would be like a anything like get, put, post, or delete where you're expecting some JSON or XML data back. Uh, that would be a data task, and you have download task and upload task for like streaming bytes to and from disk. And so the, in the completion callbacks for those, you, there's block-based ones and delegate, delegate-based ones. You get the NSURL response as one of the arguments. And NSURL response, it's like a, a super class that is generic to network connections, not specific to HTTP. So if you're making an oh, HTTP request... I hate when APIs yeah. try and do this with... <laughs> it's... it's yeah. Ah! I've never dealt with any of these classes and not 
been talking HTTP over the wire. Yeah. So I'm okay with saying, you know, let me just assume for a minute <laughs> that I'm dealing with HTTP requests. And so in order to get something useful out of the response, like headers or a status code, you have to cast what they give you to an HTTP response. Yeah. That that really bugs me. And so like AF networking has an HTTP, what is it? AF HTTP session manager. I don't think currently it does the casting for you, but it certainly could. I don't see any reason why it couldn't. And maybe I'm wrong on that. I may check that up while somebody else is talking in a little bit. But um, so the, the, that's one opportunity. In addition, like the the callback that you get for network connections, you get one callback and it's did complete with error, which kind of sounds like it failed. Uh, but error, the error that it gives you is nil if it succeeded. So uh, <laughs> you can check to see if the error is nil. Yeah, did complete with error, the error will be nil. And um, if the error is is not nil, then you can say, okay, something happened with the connection, like it timed out or it redirected too many times or the DNS, like the name was bad or there's like uh, two or three dozen error conditions that could happen where the physical request can't even be made. If you successfully make the request to the server and you get a response and the response happens to be a 500, in the eyes of an SURL session, that's a successful request, right? Mm-hmm. Like the plumbing and everything uh, held up for the life of that request. But in AF networking, you have two callbacks. You have success and failure. And in AF networking, they decide to lump any non-200 response as an error condition. See, or I, error I disagree condition with as a failure you. condition. So I think it's it doesn't necessarily bug me either way, but neither framework sort of makes that crystal clear. So I just gave a talk on this on this stuff at CocoConf in Boston, and I, I made a point to to call this out in both cases, like NSURL session. You know, if you get an error, that means like the request can't be made at all. And in AF networking, if you, you know, got a 401 unauthorized, that would go through the failure callback. I feel like you've, you've described the two things that I always get annoyed by with HTTP APIs. The, oh, we'll make it work the same for FTP and HTTP. <laughs> Cause everyone gopher. wants don't, to do that. Don't forget gopher. Oh, yeah. And the, the whole like network level errors versus application level errors it's really really hard to to get a good api for that but there's it, that's yeah. frustrating that that the two ways that you could go different. one went one way and one went the other way yeah mm-hmm. um um i think where af networking is still providing value is that there's a new design in af networking 2.0 where instead of having a af json request operation which expects a json response and there's sort of some duplication in the different types of request operation classes now there's a request and a response serializer. So you just have one class that is your session manager, AF HTTP session manager, and it hangs onto your session for you and all the configuration. And then you just tell it get put post or delete. It will return to you the data task that you just requested uh, so that you could cancel it or whatever. And it will encode the request parameters according to the request serializer type. So you have an AF form encoded serializer and an AF JSON request serializer. So if you wanted to uh, make your API accept like a login form as a post where the post body is actually JSON, not form encoded data, you could do that by just setting the request serializer to an AF JSON request serializer, which I think is really a nice design. It's yeah. uh, super easy to set. And uh, the response by default is AF JSON response serializer. So the data coming down on the wire gets encoded into a JSON dictionary or array uh, with NS JSON serialization. And there's also an XML response serializer and a property list response serializer, and you can create your own. The API for that is a it's easy to understand interface. Um, so I, I actually like that. So in the callback, I instead of getting an NS data pointer, I get a response object that is either an array or a dictionary. So it saves you a little bit of boilerplate clo- code that you're typically writing. So I've got a random question, or not that random, I guess, but do you think the any of the API design for this new Apple API was influenced by AF networking? I don't know to what extent. I'm sure that they've seen it, right? Uh, I don't think that they've got their head in the sand or anything, or they're, you know, on an island. However, um, I think that, I don't know, it, it does have, have some weird design aspects. So if you want to use the block-based completion handler, which I think is definitely something that's sort of in vogue, right? It, like everything is block-based completion. Yeah. If you want ultimate control, then you have to pass like just gobs of parameters to to the block. And then that becomes like kind of a unwieldy mess with indentation and like the way Xcode breaks lines and, you know, it becomes hard to read. And I think there's a lot of AF networking code out there that looks like that. So if you want any more detail than the request completed with error and here's the response and the data, uh, you have to set the delegate of your session. 
And if you set up the delegate of your session and you use the completion block variant, then it will not call your delegate methods for that request because the, com- the block itself is handling it. Does mm. that make sense? So if you want to receive more detailed information about, uh, about a response, like if you're downloading data and you want to receive the progress callbacks, then you have to use the delegate methods and you cannot pass in the completion block. Oh, wow. So passing in the completion block like breaks. I don't say necessarily breaks, but it's an either or situation. And it can be confusing that you, oh, I set myself up as the delegate, I implemented the methods, yeah. and this breakpoint isn't firing, and that's because you are using the completion. And that would be there. also, presumably that would be pretty frustrating if you've gone through and, and done stuff using blocks, and then suddenly you realize, oh, I need to handle this thing. Right, and now right. You have so to in, re- in one of my demos, I, I went through and converted one to the other so that I could track progress and show a progress uh, meter for a download. And it turned out that I had like all these if conditions for like, okay, if there's an error, then I'm going to just log the error because, you know, that's how you handle errors. <laughs> and then, and then in the else block, you know, you indent a little bit and then I cast the response to an HTTP response and then check the status code. And if the status code is 200, then I have this, you know, success case code. And then I have an else where I indent again and handle the non 200 response. And it turns out that if you convert that block-based completion into the delegate methods, one of the common things is turning off the network indicator for for when the response, or sorry, when the request finishes, right? So you start it before you uh, execute the request, and then in both failure and success conditions, you have to turn off the network indicator. And so you can actually do that. Uh, there's one delegate method uh, did complete with error. Like URL session did complete with error. And if you're using the download tasks, then you're going to get a different callback for that the download finished and downloaded to a specific file URL. So I would put the network activity indicator disabling code in the did complete with error. And I don't even need to check to see if there's an error. Right. It's just like it completed. Yeah. Either way. It's and then, yeah. And so it just seemed like there were more buckets for behavior and all those like various conditions that I had in my block turned out to sort of sift nicely into each of the buckets. So I, I don't necessarily think delegate methods need to be like hated on all the time. Sometimes it actually cleans things up quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, if it's a simple thing where it's either going to succeed or fail, then a block can, is great. But if you need more than two chunks of behavior, then yeah, yeah, then, then you need more than just like. Yeah, and what's your typical refactoring trick? extract method, right? <laughs> this method looks gross. I'm just going to take everything inside the if block for success and make a new method. And if you're doing that already, then, you know, maybe the delegate uh, callbacks would be uh, cleaner anyway. Hmm. So, uh, so there's that. And I think this, you know, the NSURL session design sort of dovetails nicely with the new multitasking stuff. So one thing you can do is, is turn on a background mode for your app for background fetch. And so if you had something like a weather app or uh, a Twitter app or a news app or a stock app or anything that's just sort of periodically updated, in an iOS 6, you would have to launch the application and, you know, the user staring at stale content while the request is made to update it. Uh, and so in background fetch, you can, in your app delegate, when your app wakes up, you would likely say something like, you know, application set minimum background fetch interval. And so if you're doing like a, a stock app, you know, maybe... The, the minimum interval, there's a constant. You can specify the minimum inter- interval, so that will cause your application to be called as much as possible for background fetch. And then if you had something like uh, that was only updated like once or twice a day, then you would specify that interval in seconds. Like, well, I, at the minimum, I need to be called every hour. But it could be, you, you're not really guaranteed a specific time of when you'll be called. And I, like the way, so, I like the way when Apple described that, they're kind of a little bit cagey. They're just kind of like, well, there's an algorithm and it does stuff and Right, and, and you can kind of see where your your code sort of fits into that algorithm because they give you a call. They'll wake your application up and they'll say, okay, uh, perform your background fetch. And so in, in my application, I would say, okay, I'm going to go fetch the weather for the user's current location, right? And uh, so I'm going to fetch the weather and then I'm going to save it because I'm caching whatever I got last time. And uh, then I need to tell the, they're, basically they pass in a completion handler and you're supposed to call the completion handler and let it know if you got any new data or if there was no new data or you failed. Uh, so if there's like no network, then you'd have to report that you failed. If they call you like 15 times in a row and every time you're saying I have no new data, then they're going to scale your application back. Right. And so it's kind of like a, you know, be a good citizen because the OS has the ability to slow down background fetch updates for your application. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I like that a lot. And, you know, the, the other multitasking thing I think is really interesting and it fits in with NSURL session actually is the background downloads. Um, and this is it's kind of magical how it works. 
So instead of using the default session configuration or the ephemeral uh, configuration, there's a background one and you can give it an identifier. So you'd probably do something like com dot whatever dot image download or something that uniquely identifies that particular background session. And if your app is downloading stuff and then goes into the background, the download itself, like your code that is getting executed, is actually paused. But the download magically happens somewhere else. And then when it's finished, it will notify your application and and you have a app delegate callback of uh, handle events for background session. And basically means that the background session is about to complete. So it wakes your application up so that you can do something. And then there's a final callback called uh, URL session background transfer did complete or something like that. And so your app can even crash. They did a cool demo at DubDub where the guy was downloading an image and then crashed the application by dereferencing a null pointer and then waited a few minutes or a few seconds or whatever so that we could be reasonably certain that the image had actually uh, been downloaded. And then he just double tapped the home button, which brings up the multitasking display with all the screenshots of your apps. And the uh, and the app that displayed the image was already showing the image, even though the app had crashed middle download. And so what it's actually doing is uh, the background transfer daemon is waking up the application, in this case, from a crash state. So it's launching it anew and goes through the handle, you know, background transfer events. It repaints the UI with the, you know, the image and everything, does the snapshot and all that's happening in the background. So it's kind of magical and there's a lot of pieces involved. But by using NSURL session, all the new stuff, it enables, you know, these types of interactions. And I think these are really, really important to this just overall experience of iOS. Like a lot of apps that I launch nowadays, they just already have content, which is really nice. That's cool. I like the way that Apple are kind of seeing all of the things that people, there's some things that I think Android, Android fans complain about with Apple of like, you know, you can't do multitasking, you can't do whatever. And I like that Apple haven't just done a me too kind of thing and just said, okay, well, I guess we'll have to allow multitasking. They've just found other ways to solve the same problem while still staying in control of the platform so that they can do optimizations. Wow. I sound like an Apple fanboy. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely different than just allowing apps yeah. to run in the background because honestly, you can't trust half of developers to do the right thing. You know, it's, I would say people three will quarters. Just, yeah. <laughs> so I just need to download stuff every thirty seconds on my app in the background. Is yeah, I mean, if, they, if, yeah. You, if you give them the permission to do that, people will do it, and that's why you have devices out there or other platforms which uh, don't have as good battery life, and it it means we have to sort of you know skate through the slalom poles or whatever in order to conform to these APIs, but it leads to a much better experience and you're really not sacrificing uh, much in terms of background app activity. I like James' idea, though. I think, I, I'm sure there's someone who has done some experiments of, like, different ways of trying to game the algorithm of, like, if I say I got new data every sixth time, then I, I always get yeah. called and I can and I can calculate my yeah. bitcoins in the background. And, my and customers are, demand, are demanding <laughs> this. This is a must-have feature. Yeah, it also gets rid of some of the hacks. That, <laughs> it also gets rid of some of those hacks that people did, like uh, like Instapaper wanted to do uh, like a daily download of your articles, maybe in the morning, so that you could have them. And that was sort of a newsstand only type of feature. And so uh, what was done it was something like a you could put a geofence around your house, and so when you went to your house, it would wake you up by location updates. Yeah. But that means that Instapaper needs to know your location, and that's just kind of you know it's it's definitely a hack. And I think that, you know, these new APIs allow much more apps to do the right thing in the right way. I've heard of people doing, used to do the same thing with voice over IP entitlement, right? Like if you have that flipped on, then you can leave stuff running in the background for, for networking. Right. Yeah, there was a, uh, Pacebot had the thing where they wanted to continue running in the background all the time so that it could monitor your, your paceboard. And, and so in order to do that, they turned on the audio and were playing silence and <laughs> eventually got rejected for that. Yeah. Uh, I tried the exact it's... same trick for uh, for my <laughs> testing tool. To oh yeah, to that's right. In the background, but it doesn't work in the simulator. In simulator. Really yeah. annoying. So another thing you can do now, which used to be a new stand only feature, is uh, send a silent push notification. Where instead of you have like a push notification which has you know like a little uh, JSON hash, and one of the keys is a like alert, and that's what would be displayed to the user, like you know please play my game. You haven't launched me in two weeks. And then there's also uh, sound, so you can pass in the name of a sound and it will play that sound. And then there's like whatever other metadata you might want in the push. There's a new one now, content available, in which you return one or zero in there. Uh, so you don't even have to have an alert. You can just say content available. So if I am building a social app and I have 
I, I have accepted your friend request. So the state of your application right now, because it's in your pocket, is you're waiting on me to confirm the friendship, and your friends list does not reflect my row. If if the system were to, or the server were to send you a push notification saying there's content available for that data or whatever, then the app in the background can go fetch it, uh, refresh those two lists, and then once that uh, refresh is completed, then it issues a local notification which alerts you that I accepted your friend request. So when you swipe to open your phone, the two lists are already up to date. And so it's just it's, delaying it's at the point where it notifies snapshot. you. Yeah. So like if you double, if you double tap and go to multitasking view, that you know I would already be in your friends list. So it seems quite magical. It does sound magical. So those are the sort of areas that I've been focusing on. There's so many new APIs that it's really difficult to be an expert in all of them. So I guess we have, in the time we have available, we could either rush through our uh, Mac Mac OS stuff, or we could talk more on iOS 7 stuff and then do picks. I'm sort of curious about the custom transitions. Me too. No okay. custom transition stuff in iOS 7, if either of you have any experience with that. I do. On <laughs> uh, Is anybody else? Is so I'm not hogging the mic. <laughs> Our special guest, Ben Sherman. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I'll just go out and say that the documentation is severely lacking in this area. And like a month ago, there was like no resources. And I was like, oh, I know. I'll do a screencast on view controller transitions. And literally went back and read or watched the uh, dub dub video on this topic. Uh, it must have been more than 10 times. And the guy in the video, you know, smart guy, but he makes this comment in the in the session. A lot of people have told me that this is complicated, but it's really not. And the fact that I watched it 10 times kind of tells me that it is more complicated than he gave it credit for. And that joke started to get really old every time I, I uh, listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, a tab bar, for instance, you have four tabs at the bottom, and you tap them, and it's literally like flipping tabs in your browser. The, there's no animation, right? It's just flip to the new content. And that sort of makes sense, because you can flip back and forth between any of the tabs instantly. Uh, and then navigation transition, you have uh, you tap, and it sort of pushes a new view controller, and it's animated, so you can sort of envision the the hierarchy or the sort of landscape of the navigation of your app. So, and when you tap back, you know which way the animation is going to go. Uh, and then there's a third one, which is modal. You tap, and it typically slides down from the top. And when you dismiss, the same thing. What else is there? There's cross dissolve and a flip. But it was not so easy to sort of take two view controllers and create a custom transition between them without a lot of code before. Uh, so one of the things that that uh, you might do is not move between two screens, but keep the same screen but just change the content up a little bit. So uh, like Photos in iOS 7 shows you a collection of, it's grouped by like date and where you were. Uh, so it kind of categorizes your photos for you in logical events. And so if you tap on that, it doesn't push to a new view controller or show a modal view controller on top with the new content. It uh, it actually changes the collection view layout to the new, uh, to the new uh, layout, which is sort of a zoomed in look of, Okay, now it was like this day and this day and this day instead of a grouping of one month. Uh, so you can do like layout to layout transitions on the same screen. And um, if you conform to the interactive part of the transition protocol, then you can actually drag your finger from the left edge of the screen to the right edge of the screen, just like you would be going back in a table view control, I mean a navigation controller. And it'll actually animate the transition between the two layouts. So like these small, tiny squares become bigger squares and they lay out exactly where they are in the new view. Um, and to do that, you actually just provide it two different layouts and say, tell it to animate between the two. And it's, it's easier than it sounds. I'm trying to think of exactly the best way to describe this on a podcast, but it sort of has ramifications on your design, like how you design your, your controllers, because at some point you have to provide a transitioning delegate and your transitioning delegate is the one who's going to return the appropriate interactive transition or custom transition if you have set the transitioning delegate of a view controller to some object then it's going to ask that object for your transition and so uh, the all the objects are they're none of them are concrete objects they're all protocols so you have uh, i think it's ui view controller interactive transitioning is a protocol that you would implement in your custom transition and you're basically given the two views and you can ask you can ask the context object that it passes you for uh, what is my starting frame and what is my ending frame. And now maybe I'm going to like animate along a Bezier path to get to the ending frame. Or maybe I just, you know, in, in the case of the example I built, it was 
let me position uh, one view controller. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise uh, so that it's sort of positioned off screen. And then I'm going to animate it back to uh, no transform. So it's sort of, you can imagine like a, like a you know, rotating. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, rotating from the, from the upper left hand corner, it just sort of, you know, rotates in place. And you can make that interactive. What, what I like about the interactive portion of this is it's literally almost no code. Typically you would have like a UI, uh, what is it? A UI, not a swipe gesture recognizer, but the UI pan gesture recognizer. So UI pan gesture rec- recognizer is going to call back many times as your finger moves across the screen, right? And you would typically put that on your view controller. But in the case of an interactive transition, you probably want the, the transition class itself to manage uh, the, the gesture because you need you need to be able to get the callbacks of the gesture in the transition so you can update the transition's progress. Uh, and so what I did was, as you pan closer to the right, it calculates your distance that you've traveled and uh, figures out a percentage of how far along you are along the uh, transition. And if you're sufficiently far, then it will complete it for you. So I don't actually have to do any of the interpolation or animation in between the beginning state of the rotated view and the end state of the view is, you know, perfectly centered on the screen. The, the uh, gesture recognizer just updates the percentage of the interaction and uh, the framework figures out the rest. That's really neat. So, so I'm guessing this makes it super easy to do things like um, kind of fading something out of view as you're swiping it, all those those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, like like the view that you're, is going away sort of falls back into the device a little bit, so you scale it down a little. Right. Uh, you could easily do that. I mean, there's so many things you can do. Or change the color of something as it comes in. Yeah, and I've Tweetbot is a good example of. I'm trying to think of. There's a lot of things in Tweetbot that are custom, but specifically that are interactive view controller transitions. I think there are probably two or three that are in there. So these um, delegate protocols. Does it seem like most of the time they end up being implemented on a view controller, or do you end up kind of creating a custom class to to manage this stuff? So I don't think there's enough good guidance out there yet for this. Mm-hmm. Apple sample code puts a ridiculous amount of code in the app delegate, and I yeah. am never okay with that. It's it's like if you mix that with core data and everything else that you're supposed to attach to this thing becomes some somewhat of a god object. In addition, they you know you see code all over the place that you know if you take core data sample code for example. The NS managed object context is living in the app delegate. And so a lot of view controllers will just reach into the app delegate and grab it. And that's a design you might take. But in, if in the same design you have your app delegate reaching back into your root view controller to, to like perform some operation, then I absolutely don't, uh, don't like that design because I, yeah. you've created a super tight coupling between your app delegate and the view controller and your view controller and your app delegate. And, um, I much prefer you know, raising notifications in the app delegate and having other classes handle it sort of in a much more decoupled way. And so I think, you know, these transitions should be their own objects. But if you do that, then you're sort of like, well, I need to know what the view controller is at this point. So you have to, you know, the, yeah, you're kind of has, coupling. It's, yeah, you have fundamentally to, you, have to you need to know right about context. that stuff. Right? Yeah. So I ran into a place, I'm trying to remember exactly where it is a place where I didn't know what I needed to know at the moment. So I had to raise a notification, which kind of felt wonky, a little bit wonky, but I have two uh, screencasts, not to to force people to subscribe, but there's some sample code associated with each each of them. So I will link to those uh, in the show notes on creating the initial transition and then the interactive portion of that. So if you take a look at the sample code for those, it's, uh, it's, it's not too much code, but what I, what I really like about this particular feature in iOS 7 is the uh, the interactive portion where you literally you just say update interactive transition and you pass in a percent and it figures out everything else. So it looks like I talked for about 30 minutes <laughs> about uh, networking, uh, multitasking and interactive transitions. Uh, so I wonder if we could save the, the Mac OS 10 stuff because I'm super naive about all the new stuff in, in Cocoa. So I'd like yeah, to devote more stuff to that. Yeah, I want to hear about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Not just cram, cram it in at the end of an episode. Oh, well, next time we have a guestless show, we can, or maybe we can get a guest. That I think Andrew, you're our next, next guest. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> next, next free show, we get to you, Andrew. <laughs> so I have a few questions uh, related to some of the announcements they made at the last event. They they changed the screen size, I guess, back to the same aspect ratio as the original iPhone with the 5s and 5c. Did I? misunderstand that no it's the same as the uh, the, the five the five. five yeah same as the five 
Okay. Where did you hear that, but, Chuck? I, I don't know. I heard people Chuck talking. Chuck has inside knowledge of the iPhone 7. There we go. <laughs> um, and the other thing it, that I'm curious about is uh, the the iPad Air. I mean, do do any of the hardware changes affect anything, you know, coming so down? What's interesting about that is it's literally the same screen resolution as the other I- iPad. It's just way thinner, and the bezel is considerably smaller. Mm-hmm. So it feels like they, they shed like a whole bunch of excess material. And so it's a lot lighter, but the screen size, it's it's the same. Um, and then the iPad uh, mini retina is, I think it's just a smaller screen, but pixel wise is the same. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's the, the same same number of pixels on the iPad mini as on the iPad Air. Just Which smaller. means it's like super retina. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> actually higher, you know, higher pixels per inch than the full size iPad. I was really hoping that they would have that in the Apple stores already so I could play with them, but. No such a luck. We'll have to wait a couple more days. Yeah. Uh, well, the iPad Mini, the Retina iPad Mini, is quote later in November, whatever that means. Oh, I thought that was on the first two. Dang, because I really want to try them both. I have an iPad three right now, and my wife has an iPad Mini, and literally, like the Mini feels so much better. It's lighter. It's more like if you're reading in bed and you're holding that thing above your head, it's sort of fatiguing. The iPad three is somewhat heavier than the the Mini. I have a, a iPad 3 and an iPad mini and we moved in July and I seriously do not know where my iPad 3 is. I'm sure I could find it, but it, there's just, I just have no reason to use it. The mini is so much nicer. Yeah, I have, yeah an iPad, I, I have an iPad 1. If I'm doing anything, it's usually on either my phone or my Kindle just because the same thing, the form factor is just smaller and a little easier to deal with. I must be the only person left that uses this full-size iPad. I watch movies on mine, that's it. I just use my MacBook Air, which is about iPad sized. There you go. I write all my code in my iPad. Don't you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually. I get mocked for using my MacBook Air for writing all of my code. It's like the little 11 inch MacBook Air, but it does the job for me. Yeah, I. I it looks like I'm going to be able to go to RubyConf. It's kind of been on again, off again, but uh, I'm going to be speaking there about how to do development in the cloud, and so all you need is an SSH client and an internet connection on your iPad and you can code on it. I, d- I did that at, at DubDub. Somebody had one of the keyboards, like the keyboard cases. I think it was a Logitech one. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was interested in learning a little bit of Rails while we were waiting in the keynote line. And literally tethered to my phone and SSH'd into a Linode box and, and went That's to town. Awesome. It, was, it was fun. The, the lack of escape key was the biggest problem. I forget what is a control right bracket or something to do escape in Vim or to like exit uh, insert mode in Vim without escape. Well, that that's your problem. That's You're true. using Vim. I use Emacs, and it works just fine. <laughs> I would love to see someone using a touch screen to use Emacs. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chuck, you would, are you going like, to do your multi-touch presentation would on... would be necessary, right? What was that? Yeah. Are you going to do your presentation on, a, uh, on an iPad mini? No, what I'm probably going to do... This is totally off topic, but what I'm probably going to do is uh, I'm probably going to just do all the stuff on my uh, laptop, and then from there, I'll either turn on Reflector app and connect my iPad to it, if I can, if the Wi-Fi is good enough. And if I can't, then I'll just have a video for backup. I'd make a video, dude. I mean, like, that that, that seems like you are tempting so many demo gods by trying to do yeah, a demo that... of, like, live demo of this needs the internet in order to, for it to yeah. work. To well, it needs, it not only needs the internet, but it needs, like, working Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi yeah. that allows you to see other machines on the network. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like I said, I'm probably going to have a video to back it up. <laughs> You'll probably need to sacrifice your iPad to, you know, make it all work right. There know? we yeah. go. Blend it live on stage. Yeah, one of my sponsors for Ruby Rogues came through and said that they would uh, pay for my airfare and hotel, which is why it's on again. <laughs> awesome. You should probably name that sponsor because they've just given you some, some wonderful yeah. sponsorship kudos. Yeah, it's it's New Relic. Nice. So. Good on them. You know who works at New Relic now? Who? Ward Cunningham. Oh, really? Oh, really? Wow. As far as I know, he does. At least he was showing me around his the office. They have inside, uh, in Portland, they have... Uh, street view inside the New Relic building, he, and I was I was chatting to him about something, and he was like ch- telling me to drive around the like the New Relic building office inside it with Street View, and it was very surreal. And they have uh, very 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 beautiful views of downtown Portland from their offices. Oh, nice! And also a wonderful service. Anyway, so is there anything else we need to cover on the 
new <laughs> APIs front. <laughs> Any other tangents we want to yeah. head down? I mean, there were like 1,500 new APIs. So uh, I think I covered a dozen or so. Yeah. Uh, so there's still, you know, there's lots more that we could potentially cover, but I don't know. Maybe we'll we'll get uh, Mr. NS Hipster Matt Thompson on and he'll talk about maybe some of the more esoteric ones. Yeah, we should also point out that if you the listener have any in particular that you want us to cover um and or you know somebody that could cover it, just send me an email chuck at devchat.tv and we'll see if we can get them on the show. Somebody at CocoConf Boston came up and said they liked the show. I guess that means that people actually listen to the show. I thought you were just keeping all these recordings for yourself, Chuck. That's right. This is this is my ongoing tutorial into iOS. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, things have been going really well with a lot of the shows. And I know that the listeners are sometimes curious about this. So let me pull up numbers and I can actually tell you. And then we'll get into the picks. Anybody have any jokes while he's pulling? <laughs> so <laughs> last, last month we had 3,455. 3, this month so far we have 3,892 listeners. And the month isn't over yet. We have like two more days. And it's picking up. In August, we had 2,867. So um, we picked up about 600 listeners uh, in September. And it looks like we'll pick up another like 500 in October. So Nice. Going straight to the top. Yeah. So thanks, everybody, for who, for sharing the show and letting us know that you like it. It's it's always fun to go to the conferences and stuff and find people who are enjoying the show. So We're coming for you, TED Talks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and do the picks. Pete, do you want to go first? I would love to go first. I have a random selection of picks today, none of which are at all related to what we've been talking about, neither the tangents nor the actual topic. My first pick is Git, because it's amazing. I just had a wonderful experience the other day where I had to do some crazy gymnastics with code, and I was explaining to someone else on my team how to do it with Git and the act of explaining it to, to them and made me realize just how powerful a tool it is and how elegant a model it is. So I don't know. I don't think it's really worth picking because I'm assuming most people use it by now. If you don't, then you should use Git and or Mercurial, I guess. Mercurial is cool, but Git's better. Um, and if, you, if you're stuck <laughs> in a world of SVN, then um, Git SVN Bridge is um, a very, very, very um, simple or not very, very simple, but very, very, very workable solution for having SVN as your main repo, but using Git on your on your dev machine. I, I did that for several years, and it was it was all good. My next pick is a competitor podcast, just because. Um, so it's a p- podcast called Build Phase from the guys at Fortbot. Um, I should never pick Fortbot things because I get annoyed when people think I work for Fortbot, not Fortworks, but I, I think they're <laughs> a great bunch of guys anyway. <laughs> They also said very nice things about um, about Frank on one of their podcasts. So it's a great, it's it's a good podcast, just kind of conversational uh, chit chat kind of thing. But I, I really like it. My third pick is a application called One Password. So I've been trying to get better at passwords recently and not having, you know, not sharing passwords across accounts and having better passwords and stuff. I tried another app and I uh, didn't really like it. It kind of got in my way too much. But One Password. It really, 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 it's, it's seamless enough and frictionless enough that it, I, I don't dislike using it. It kind of just gets out of the way, but lets you actually be secure with your passwords and stuff. Um, and it has an Apple, it has a, an iOS app and a, a Mac app and it integrates with your, with all of your browser and makes it very, very simple. It's actually pretty expensive, but it's worth, <clears throat> I think it's worth the money. And my last pick is beer. This week I had on tap. Uh, a Mybock from Bear Republic. And the only other Mybock I've ever had is is Dead Guy from Rogue, which I think quite a lot of people have heard of. So this is um, it's kind of an obscure German style called a Mybock, but Dead Guy is a well-known beer in Bear Republic uh, in Healdsburg in California. Also make a Mybock, and it's very yummy. So if you happen to live in the Bay Area or Northern California area, then... Uh, you should seek it out. I only think it's on tap. I don't think you can get it in bottles, but highly recommended by me. That's it. All right, Ben, what are your picks? Uh, so recently, so I was a longtime Instapaper user. Like a couple months ago, I decided, actually it was around dub dub time, so the summer, I decided to try Pocket, and after about four months, I don't really like Pocket. Uh, so I went back to Instapaper. Um, and it's under new ownership, and those people are taking the product forward, and I really like the changes they've made. And uh, in particular, I think it's just, in general, better at parsing blog posts with code in them than Pocket was. Uh, so 
I'd like to pick that. And then for a booze pick, I am trying a Glen Morangi Quinta Ruban. It's a uh, it's a scotch that is aged in port casks, and it is quite good. And then I don't know if anti picks are a thing, uh, but I had a just ridiculously bad pumpkin beer in Boston called Pumpkin Head Beer, and I would stay away from that. It tasted like Bud Light with nutmeg. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pumpkin Spice Bud Light. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, Jane, what are your picks? So I'm going to piggyback on what Pete was doing with Git. I was at the Twin Cities Code Camp a few weeks ago, and Keith Dalby did a talk on Git, Get More Done. He goes over a, little, a few more advanced things, because basically what I've been doing for Git for a couple of years is just doing SVN with Git, you know, pull, commit, push. So he goes over some, actually some really cool things that help you kind of understand kind of the power, like doing a partial commits. So if you're working along in something and you find a nasty bug and you want to fix it, but you've got all this other code kind of mixed mix it up. You can do a partial commit and just um, commit the one part that you actually changed in the hunk. A lot of times you can just do that and keep on keep going on your way. That, there's a video from that, not the, from the Norwegians Developer Conference, that's online. So it's up there for everyone to see. I'll, I'll paste a link to it. It's called Get More Done. All right. Andrew, what are your picks? So I feel like picking Mercurial to get picks, but I won't do that. <laughs> Um, Ever the I, dissenting opinion. Yeah, I, I we use Mercurial and it's stinky, and I actually really like it, but I have nothing against it. So my first pick is a is an app. I hope this hasn't been picked before, but I use it almost every day, and so I thought I would pick it. And it's called Xscope, and it's by the guys at Icon Factory. And this is this is an app for UI designers and developers. Uh, it's got a bunch of tools that you can use to help you with those tasks, things like on-screen rulers. A uh, magnifying loop with a with a color measurement tool that can generate NS color and UI color declarations automatically. Uh, and and one really cool feature that I like is they they have a they have a, a companion app for iOS that lets you mirror a, a Photoshop window or a portion of your screen to your iOS device, so you can make changes in Photoshop and immediately see how that will look on on the iOS device. And that's it's by the Icon Factory who are long-standing, well-known Mac and iOS developers and also designers. It's a great app. The next one may be obvious, but I look forward to these every year or every OS X release, and this is John Syracuse's review of Mavericks for Ars Technica. It's 24 pages long. I think I think I read tw- around 24,000 words, but it's well worth reading. It's a, a in-depth overview of, of all the new stuff in Mavericks. And then finally, my last pick is a, a talk that Cable Sasser gave at XOXO this year, and it's not it's not a technical talk. Cable is Cable's a great guy and a good speaker and fun to listen to, but this talk was sort of serious and uh, about some experiences he's had recently and how he dealt with them, and, and it's well worth watching. Those are my picks. All right, um, I've got a couple of picks. The first one is. Um, a system that I've been using for comments on my blogs and podcasts for a while. It's called LiveFire. And uh, I've been working on moving everything over to one site. And I've got the site just about ready to go. I realized that all of these different sets of comments are in their own little uh, sub-account on my account. And I wanted to be able to merge them all so I can put them all on one site. And so I emailed LiveFire support. And keep in mind, this is a free service and uh, they turned around and immediately said, yeah, we can do that for you. Just let us know when you're ready and what you want us to do. So, uh, you know, props to them for giving great support on a free product. My dad on Sunday also got me hooked on a couple of games um, for the iPhone. One is called Dragon Veil, um, and you basically just breed and raise dragons. And the other one is actually called Dragon City, and it's they're pretty similar. They're a little bit different. They're kind of uh, the the Farmville type apps, except you don't have to log in every 10 minutes and check on it. And so uh, I've been enjoying those. And so when I get a few minutes every few hours, it's just like, okay, I'll check it and, you know, do whatever. And then, you know, I'm off of it in like two minutes. And anyway, it's a lot of fun. So um, I'll put links to those in the show notes as well. Those are my picks. And with that, we'll wrap up. Thanks, guys, for coming. Thanks for Thank being you. our expert guest today, Ben. Thanks for having me on the show. (laughs) This was the best episode ever. There you go. Thanks, Jay. It was. Appreciate it. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll catch you all next week. See See ya. See ya.